Good afternoon and welcome to today's session of the lunch series. Today we have Dr. Scott Stewart. He is one of our UTIA entomologists. Uh, he is housed on the West Tennessee Research and Education Center in Jackson, but he does have statewide duties. So uh, Dr. Stewart's going to talk to us today about insect pressure in row crops. So thank you, Dr. Stewart. Thanks, Amanda. And uh, I'm going to try to keep my eye on this chat or don't hesitate to shout out if you got a question. I'm probably not going to be very long and I'm definitely not going to use a PowerPoint. I'm going to I'm going to show some images, show some some things online and, and some videos and stuff talking about some of the, the key issues, uh, some of the things I'm seeing this year and some broader I guess higher level thoughts about some things, but uh, I didn't prepare anything very formal. And in fact, I thought I was going next week until a few days ago, Dr. Kelly had to reschedule. So I'm, I'm kind of subbing in uh, and I'm gonna restrict most of my comments to corn or soybean because just based on who's on the call and who I expected to be on the call, I don't think there's gonna be a lot of people that have significant amount of cotton in their county. This year, that includes a lot of people that, that don't have a significant amount of cotton. But, uh, you know, for insects, cotton's kind of the crop we probably worry most about. But of course, all these other crops have their own concerns. I, I'm gonna start out just by uh, reviewing some of the resources that we have available. And, uh, you know, like some feedback down the road, I think Amanda might ask some, some questions of you, poll questions of you about, some of our online resources and how useful you find them or what kind of feedback you're getting from the clients. And I'll probably refer back to these resources during my presentation to make some other points, but I, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. So in a second or so, anyhow, what I hope is uh, showing up is a screenshot of some, some of our web resources. And we've got several resources that are all, I hope, pretty easy to find. That's something we've really tried to do really since I came here at Tennessee is to make all our uh, web resources available. Remind everybody about utcrops.com. That was kind of our first big website resource and, and we've added components to that right there. You can go to any of these resources I'm about to talk about and you should be able to cross back and forth pretty seamlessly. Now this is the homepage for utcrops.com and uh, Again, I'm going to come back to this to point out a couple of other things, but if you go down here in the middle of the page, you'll see some quick links here. Uh, that's a link to our news blog site uh, where we do our weekly newsletter that's electronically shared. This is our pest guide, uh, and I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit. There's links to the variety trial data, all in the central location, and then some other links as well. Uh, I'm going to talk a, a little bit about soybean and soybean scouting today, but I did just want to put a plug in. Y'all might have seen an email from me this morning talking about our, our soybean scout school. That's scheduled for 9 a.m. Uh, July 8th. I just published an article, a reminder article about it on our news blog site. That's what you're looking at right now. Uh, so uh, that's going to be about probably a two, two and a half hour program. Won't be any longer than that. And of course, normally we do these at several locations in a field. But this year we're going to do it by Zoom, but I think it'll work out okay. We have a lot of really good online resources that I'll, I'll mention again in a minute. Just uh, you can go in here and get a, a Zoom link, uh, follow the Zoom link, but there's a password required. That email I sent out to all the ANR agents this morning had the password in it. Uh, so if you got that email, you'll have the password. Uh, there's also a link in there to go to Super because it's entered as an in-service training event in Super, so you can enroll in there if you want credit. So again, you can go to our news blog, get that link, or just go to your email. But that's next uh, uh, next Wednesday, I think, is July 8th. That's a program put on by myself, Dr. Steckel, Dr. Kelly, and Dr. McClure. Uh, so it covers a, a reasonable <laughs> depth of, of topics. So I put that plug in there and just again, one of the nice things about the UT Crops uh, blog side is it's real time. There's new articles coming out all the time. Uh, it's sent out by email automatically. If you're on the list every Thursday late afternoon, if, if you're not getting it, you can actually scroll down on this site and you can sign up for it right here. You just put your email address, your first name and your last name. I think what it's probably gonna do is send you a 
hey, did you sign up for this? Make sure when you sign up for it, if you don't get that confirmation, uh, look in your junk folder because sometimes it does go to your junk folder. Now, once you do that, you'll be subscribed uh, indefinitely. Of course, you can unsubscribe anytime you want. I will warn you because we have some county agents that share that newsletter with others in their county, a, a, another mail group to make sure they get it. If you do that and the person you send it to doesn't want it and they unsubscribe, it doesn't unsubscribe them, it unsubscribes who it was sent to. So we had issues in the past with oh. agents getting unsubscribed and they, they were uh, unaware that that had happened. So if you're gonna share it with clients, I would take out that unsubscribe part unless you want them to unsubscribe you from the newsletter. Uh, again, going back to our, uh, our main website, I wanted to point out a couple of things. And one of the things we're really featured at this scout school is we have some really good online resources. And in fact, I have another one that we're just about to post. And if you want to find them, you just go to this left menu and look at presentations. And uh, we have a heading called new agent training. You might remember Dr. Burns really wanted us to develop some content for new agents. So these are pretty basic videos, several of them about uh, soybean, insect scouting in soybean, uh, managing soybean diseases, soybean weed management. Again, a number of links right there, and they're all just relatively short YouTube videos. And again, I'm about to put another one on there that goes in, into some more details about uh, insect management and soy. Uh, <clears throat> that's a really good resource. Uh, again, some of these videos are pretty good quality. Ginger, Ginger Rousey over here has worked with a lot of these and she does a, an excellent job. So uh, keep that in mind. And then, you know, something you can direct your, your growers to here. There's Dr. McClure, for example, talking about soybean growth and development. I guess I could be lazy and just show these videos and, and, uh, <laughs> and not even talk anymore. But, uh, you know, I think there is an advantage, of course, to, to speaking to people and showing them hands-on show and tell. All right, so uh, you know, I can go back to the UT Crops main website and uh, I can go to these uh, pest guides and you can link to them here. I've already got it open. So we have uh, a guide site. It's really the kind of the intent of this, at least from my perspective, is it's a mobile friendly insect control guide with the advantage that there can be pictures included in there. Uh, there's on this website, it's entomology content and plant pathology content. So Dr. Kelly has sections as well. I'll just feature some of the things that are on the, the, corn, the corn and soybean insect sites, but there is content up there for wheat, sorghum, uh, and, and other crops as well. I have the corn insect site pulled open right here, for example, just to sh show you what it's got. This is the format for all these different crops. You can go corn, uh, in this case, insect guide. I don't think Dr. Kelly has her corn content posted yet. I'll talk later about corn borers. So if you go to the main page and just click corn insect guides, you get some general information at the bottom. For example, there's a table talking about the BT corn. Uh, how good it is on the various pests and what the threshold, or the, excuse me, the refuge requirements are. Uh, there's comments about some premixed insecticides that may not show up, but they all have the same format. So for example, if I want to understand uh, managing corn borers and corn, I click on that. There's going to be some general information about the species we're talking about. In this case, Southwestern corn borer and European corn borer. There's going to be information you can expand on about sampling, how to sample for them. There's going to be information about treatment thresholds. And, and the part I like most about this online format is there's information about, well, there's a photo gallery of all the different pests and the kind of damage that they do. If you click on these images, they'll expand to full size. And another thing I really like about it, which is a format we've gone to in our hard copy publications, is there's a table of insect control recommendations and we've really simplified it quite a bit and on the rightmost column uh, what you see is a performance rating that's on a scale of zero to ten uh, ten would be perfect control zero would be no control so you won't see anything in there with a zero we don't recommend things with zeros uh, i don't you won't see many things in there that are uh, five or below. In this case, you see a five, but it's kind of a relative control. If we have some questions or we don't feel like we have enough data, 
there might be a question mark in there. And then there's some other tips for control. But I, I think that's pretty useful. And again, uh, you can go to the soybean insect guide. Uh, for example, if I go to soybean, there's an insect guide, there's foliar diseases, Dr. Kelly's done seedling diseases, et cetera, et cetera. And a very similar format. So you have all the common pests that occur, and I may again refer back to some of these here in a minute. So uh, I do wanna talk about a couple of issues that are kind of occurring right now, or at least a couple of things I expect to occur. One of them is, is three-cornered alfalfa hopper and soybean. Uh, it's predominantly a bigger problem in our wheat beans, a little bit later crop. Uh, just keep in mind with this three-cornered alfalfa hopper, uh, it's a strictly no-till pest. It's a, it's a little insect that honestly I consider almost a non-pest in many circumstances. If you have a really adequate plant stand, you don't run into issues with the three-cornered alfalfa hopper. But I'll, I'll go ahead and pull up uh, the information we have on the web. That's what the adult looks like. It's about a quarter inch. It's kind of triangle shaped, hence its name. Uh, it, it's kind of uh, different. It's, it's got a beak. It doesn't chew holes in the plants. What it does is throughout its life, really as the immature stage or the adult, it takes its beak and it girdles the stems of plants. So it goes around in a circle in, inserting that beak and feeding. And when it does that, it creates a weak spot on the plant. If it does that to a small seedling plant, you'll end up with a scar or a callus at the base of that plant. And in some circumstances, particularly later in the season, when you get a little bigger plant and you get a little wind on it, those plants will break over. And I'm sure a lot of folks in this, on this call have had the experience of walking through a soybean field and you kick a plant and it just pops over, kind of makes a little snapping sound. That's three-cornered alfalfa hopper. And what you have to remember is that damage that, that occurred happens when that plant's very small, often most of the time three or four inches tall or smaller. They'll feed on larger plants, but then they'll start girdling leaf petioles or the upper part of the stem, which doesn't really cause any problems. So just pulling up the photo gallery of it, you've seen that picture. This is an example of where a stem's been girdled and, and broke over at the base of the plant. This is an example of a leaf petiole. This is very characteristic. Later in the season, you'll see where that leaf petiole has been girdled and it just dangles. And, and down here, you'll see these multiple girdle sites on the base of a plant. Now this girdling happened when that plant was very small, but this is that callus or scar that can cause, cause breaking. So on late planted wheat beans, a lot of times we see thinner stands in our wheat beans anyhow. Uh, the insect populations are a little bit higher. They seem to like that no-till environment. What I recommend people do is, is go out there and scout and see if they're many, seeing many three-cornered alfalfa hoppers. And if they're seeing enough, they need to make a treatment again while those plants are very small. And you can use the, typically the pyrethroid insecticides. It's a little bit of a challenge to scout these. I won't lie to you. It requires a little bit of professional judgment. Uh, we don't have really solid thresholds. It's really kind of an experience thing. But if you go out there, you can run a sweep net on these small beans. Make sure you're catching them or when you get good with your eyes and just seeing that they're popping around because they do hop. Uh, this time of year, you'll be dealing almost exclusively with the adults. Uh, you might consider treatment. And again, I would really do that primarily if I had thin stands. Because what happens with those thin stands is you get girdling on that plant, but that plant gets a lot bushier and heavier and it's more inclined to break later in the season, not only because it's top, got more uh, weight on the top, but also it doesn't have as many neighbors helping to support it. I was gonna just uh, kind of digress a little bit and talk about insecticide seed treatments and, and just show you some examples of, of things I've seen this year. You know, you probably field calls, or I know everybody's aware of all the issues of the the fire that the neonicotinoid seed treatments are uh, for use and they're being blamed on, over blamed honestly on, on the impacts on pollinator health. And you'll see all kinds of stuff and people come in and say, well, I read they, they don't really even do anything. So uh, first thing I warn you is, you know, what you see online 
may be from some place where they don't have as much value, but in the South, we typically see very strong value from these insecticide seed treatments. I'll just show you a little bit of data we collected in Milan this year. I just put this graph together. This is a test we do as a group regionally in Mid-South, and I typically see uh, probably less than my colleagues further south, but very consistently we'll see pretty significant stand reductions if we don't use insecticide seed treatments. And you can see that in this, this graph, that bottom bar is the untreated bar. This is the number of plants per 70 row feet, and we're a good 20 to 25 plants shorter, about 20% stand reduction in plant stand with, when we didn't use an insecticide seed treatment. Really all the insecticide seed treatments gave comparable control. And this is a result of insect injury. And I think a lot of people probably wouldn't even recognize that's what it is. And I'll, I'll talk about that. But this is actually far worse than it looks because a lot of these plants that aren't dead, that you say, well, there's a plant there, aren't going to be very viable plants. They're either not going to produce an ear, they're going to produce a very, very stunted ear. And the one that got us in Milan this year is the one that uh, probably causes our most problems, and that's wireworm. So this is a picture from that test where I dug up a couple of wireworms and I happened to get a, a cutworm in there. But that wireworm will take out the seed or the feet on the roots or the stem right below the ground level when it's very small. And often it may, uh, the plant may not emerge and you'll see stand reduction that way. Very often that plant will be weakened and if it does emerge, it's uneven. It doesn't ever really catch up with the other ones. And uh, even if it doesn't die, it gets what we call called dead heart. So just to give you an idea what that looks like, when you're scouting a soybean field, or excuse me, a corn field, one of the things you're looking for for insect injuries when it's small is what entomologists call dead heart. And that's where the growing point of that plant, which is that emerging whorl leaf, or the growing point's actually in the stem, comes out and it's wilted. And when you see that, that's a very high likelihood that something's done some root or stem feeding and has killed the growing point of that plant. And that plant's done for. And in fact, if you uh, go back and you start seeing plants that look like this a little bit later, now you can see that wilted leaf is gone. That plant will stay green very often. It won't necessarily die. But what happens is it doesn't grow normally and it doesn't uh, produce an ear. And here's just a, another example of that. Oops, that's the same one. Here's, here's some dead heart that was caused by southwestern corn borer, and you can see that whorl leaf is, is dead, but that plant doesn't have a normal growing point. It's gonna start suckering out. If you go into a field this time of year and you start seeing a lot of plants that are bushing out at the bottom, you know, they got sucker plants coming off of them, that's a good indication that you might have had an insect problem early season. So we consistently see this in, in Jackson and Milan in my test all the time. I tell you, this is kind of a, a side story, but what was really interesting in this test at Milan is we had six replicates uh, planted. It was those 10 treatments, but there were six replicates deep. And the treatment effect was very evident in the first four replicates. And in the last two replicates, uh, we really didn't see a treatment effect at all. And I put a little thought to that and started talking to Blake Brown there at Milan, because I couldn't really figure out what was going on, but I, I had a guess. What that was, was last year, they planted soybean into that location. Vince Pantalone had some of his breeding material in the first four reps, testing those, those soybean breeding lines, and none of that had an insecticide seed treatment. The last two reps, and along the side of the test, they just filled it in with, with uh, soybean that did have an insecticide seed treatment. That actually showed up this year, and the reason it did is because we're dealing with wireworm and they have at least a two-year lifespan. So we took wireworms out last year in soybean in those areas in those last two reps uh, where we had that insecticide seed treatment. So there was kind of an effect that I've seen before in, in the real world, but it showed up in our, our test plots. So I'm going to show you a couple of, I, I've talked a lot in the past about cover crops, um, and I just want to show you some data from this year. And this is a complicated, or some videos really, this is a complicated thing because looking at cover crops, particularly with soybean, but also with corn, the impacts that they might have on, on your pest populations and your plant stands and et cetera, really depends on what the cover crop is and how you manage it. Manage it. But I'm gonna show a video from a test this year where we had a, a cover crop 
that is a standard recommended cover crop. It had uh, oats, it had barley, it had Austrian pea, and it had clover, although there wasn't much crimson clover in it. And then when we did this, we did this experiment, we had parts of the cover crop that as soon as we planted it, we burned it down, so there really wasn't a cover crop. We had other treatments where we burned down the cover about three weeks before planting, and then we imposed an insecticide seed treatment or we didn't. And then we had another treatment where we burned down the cover crop actually after we planted, the day after we planted. And I'll show this video. And this is why I say ne you never say never. I'll try to stop this, but so that's the that's the first replicate. I'm gonna pause it right there. That's the uh, cover crop was planted there, and you can see the wheat and barley stems. But this had an insecticide seed treatment. These are eight row plots. So as we go across, you'll see the plot stakes. That's row one. Now we're starting to get into the second set of eight rows. So that right there. That's your cover crop without an insecticide seed treatment. But in this case, it was burned down three weeks in advance. So we see it's not as pretty as the first eight rows, but there's a, there's a, there's a stand there to be seen. Uh, we do see there's a little bit of problem. So now we're gonna go into the next treatment, which I think you'll see coming up shortly. This is an insecticide seed treatment where there was no cover crop. We burned it down right after planting kept it more or less weed free all the way up to the time of planting. Uh, and of course the, the issue here is this cover crop is providing insects sometimes that feed on our soybean. We're going across, those beans look really good. Now we're getting into the next treatment. And, and here we go, that's no cover crop without an insecticide seed treatment. And I think you can see not quite as spiffy, not quite as vigorous, but again, we have a pretty adequate soybean stand. There may or may not be yield of impacts from that insecticide seed treatment. Now, one thing I think is interesting, and I'll get here along the edge and pause it again, is one of the reasons we're doing eight row plots here is based on my previous experience, we've seen that you need to go bigger plots to see this effect because what happens is insects from an adjacent treatment can bleed out into your plots. And, and that's exactly what you're looking at here. Our next treatment's got a cover crop on it. And the insects that were coming out of the cover crop were moving several rows into the next treatment. So now we're gonna go into the treatments that had a cover crop that was burned down the day we planted it. That right there is an insecticide seed treatment. Uh, looks pretty dang good. And in fact, it's a little harder to see because of all the straw. I would rate this really just about as vigorous as where we didn't have a cover crop. Now here's where the rub comes in. So we're now we're gonna get out uh, where we did our burn down the day of planting and we didn't use an insecticide seed treatment. And I think that's pretty obvious. That's gonna be substantial yield limiting uh, plant reduction. And this is caused by several insects and it varies from year to year which one's doing it. Uh, we've seen this with southern corn rootworm, which is something I've really never seen in soybean unless you have a cover crop. Uh, we've seen it with an insect called the pea leaf weevil, which is a tiny little insect that as a larvae feeds on the root and as a adult essentially gnaws the plants to the ground. Uh, we've seen issues with three-cornered alfalfa hoppers because they're attracted uh, to the legumes that are in that cover crop. And, and that's a real take-home point for y'all guys is, you know, uh, you, you, when the cover crop matches the cash crop, that's when you can get into issues. It looks to me like we can mitigate a lot of the risk by either burning that cover down, crop down early or using an ins, at least an insecticide seed treatment, if not a foliar spray. Uh, it's to the point now where if we've got a legume in that cover, like a crimson clover, an Austrian pea, or some kind of vetch, uh, we better use an insecticide seed treatment if we're planting a legume like soybean behind it. And uh, I said I wasn't going to talk a lot about cotton, but I wanted to show you another video just of, of the treatment effects because we had a pretty substantial thrips infestation this year. And I'm going to pause this right here. This is a test from one of my graduate students at the Milan Experiment Station. And it was kind of a, a, a funny story because uh, I had some guys up looking at this new BT technology for cotton that controls thrips. And the treatments we were comparing it to was cotton with an insecticide C treatment. And they looked pretty rough. They looked kind of like this cotton right here, it's kind of skippy, and you could definitely see some damage. And they said to me, uh, well, I don't think this insecticide seed treatment is doing very much. 
So this treatment we're looking at here is actually four plants per foot with an imidacloprid, gaucho insecticide seed treatment, a two row plot. The one I'll pause it on next is the exact same treatment without an insecticide seed treatment. That's pretty, pretty stark guys. And those plants are dead. They actually came up, they just, they just flat got killed. And the next treatment we'll look at is actually eight seed per foot, which is much higher than we'd normally do, but we had very poor emergence conditions. Actually, the point of this test was to look at how plant populations affected things. But uh, you can see that insecticide seed treatment is, is really, really dramatic. So I'm gonna close that out and uh, maybe talk a little bit about um, corn borer. I think most of the people on this call are probably from areas that are considered non-cotton counties. Uh, that being the case, your refuge requirements are considerably less. If you're in a county that's not designated as a cotton county, you can actually, depending on the corn you're growing, grow some varieties that you only have to have a 5% refuge. And in fact, uh, in those counties with certain technologies, that refuge can be incorporated into the bag as a seed mix, which makes compliance very easy. Uh, I will mention that the primary reason we plant BT corn is not for corn earworm, it's not for fall armyworm. It, it, it can help, particularly with fall armyworm, but they're not major pest for it in Tennessee. It's for corn borers, and that's European and southwestern corn borer. And the southwestern corn borer is the, the one we have uh, the most in the state. And I think people forget that there is pretty consistent value to having uh, having that technology. You know, this is this is what the moth looks like, just a plain, plant, uh, ordinary white moth. I'm showing it because really our best tool for monitoring whether we have southwestern corn borer problems or the potential for problems in non-BT corn is by moth trapping. Uh, I strongly suggest if anybody's consistently growing uh, non-BT corn, they run these pheromone moth traps. I, I'll be happy to dish some out. We run a trap line. I share them with agents frequently. If you look at this picture right here, it's, a, it's called a bucket trap. The pheromone actually goes in the top container. This is one of the best pheromone traps I've used for actually predicting what's going on in your field. Uh, I didn't notice there's actually a moth on the outside of that bucket, but you just open it up and check it weekly, and we actually have treatment thresholds based on the stage of your corn and the number of moths that you're, you're collecting. One of the reasons the southwestern corn borer is so damaging, and you know, here's a picture of a small larvae. They're pretty characteristic, but there's other larvae you gotta learn to distinguish it from, but they have this, this dark head when they're small with these pretty conspicuous dark spots. Uh, but one of the reasons they're so damaging is they do stalk tunneling. And when they stalk tunnel, they interfere with nutrient and water flow. So this is a bigger larvae. They're pretty easy to distinguish because they're pretty white with these conspicuous white spots. And of course, they're gonna be typically inside a stalk tunneling. Uh, during the whirl stage, uh, you'll see the small larvae in the whirl, but they'll come out and also stalk tunnel. That stalk tunneling causes all kinds of problems. It stunts the plant, it, it stresses it out, so it increases the incidence of aflatoxin. Uh, probably the biggest issue you see with it is at harvest time because what happens is that insect has a habit at the end of the year of going down while on the inside of the plant right above the ground it essentially cuts the plant makes a girdle and those plants will lodge and fall over and that's what you're looking at here in this picture is every one of these plants that's laying on the ground has been girdled and it's pretty clean cut by those larvae they actually spend the winter inside the stalk as a larvae really right below the, the soil level so they're kind of prepping that plant for their escape next year. Uh, that can cause substantial yield loss. I have people that kind of forget about them because we grow so much BT corn that they don't realize they're out there, but I just took this video of my plots last week where we consistently grow some non-BT corn on the station. All this leaf feeding that you're seeing, these, that's all from Southwestern Corn Board that are feeding in the world. They're now tunneling in the stalks, and this is just walking down the the non-BT border of this test, and you can see our in, infestation rates pretty high. Uh, I've heard some old timers tell people, ah, oh, you can't do anything about it, you know, unless you plant BT corn, but I'm telling you, I've got plenty of data. Well-timed insecticide applications can greatly increase yield. 
it's a real challenging insect to scout, particularly when you get to the tasseling stage, and that's one of the reasons we promote the use of the pheromone traps and treatment based on pheromone trap catches. Uh, you don't need many traps. I think a grower, if he has a couple of fields, probably needs two or three traps, and they're, they're relatively inexpensive. So, uh, you know, encourage your growers to do that. Uh, I don't have just a whole heck of a lot for you other than th those comments. You know, right now our soybean insect situation is pretty modest. I, I really haven't had the first phone call about anything in, a, in probably seven or 10 days. You know, we're seeing a little bit of green clover worm defoliation. Japanese beetles are out in areas, so we're seeing a little bit of defoliation from them or, leaf, or bean leaf beetles, but, but nothing real dramatic. Uh, in probably the next uh, couple of weeks, we'll start seeing some kudzu bugs trickle in as they mature off kudzu, but I'm actually expecting our kudzu bug infestations to be pretty light this year, and in part because we had a late freeze, and so I got a couple of patches that I keep an eye on, and we had kudzu bugs pretty good on those, and then the freeze took the kudzu out and really put it, set them back, and I think took some of the kudzu bugs out too, so we're not seeing a whole lot of them. Uh, when just another plug when it comes to soybean, keep up with the news blog, current events, what's happening. Uh, go to that soybean scout school and we'll get a lot more information about uh, sampling. Uh, also, anybody that wants, a, wants some sweet nets, uh, let us know. Uh, you know, right away, uh, I'll send you some sweet nets by mail. You may have a grower that wants to use them. Normally, we would distribute those at our infield scout schools, but uh, uh, not going to have that opportunity, so I'll be glad to ship anybody sweep nets. And again, there's an online video that discusses how you use that sweep net. But of course, you need a little bit of training, and that includes learning to identify the insects. I don't have anything else pulled up that I was uh, really planning on showing you, but uh, you know, I said right now soybeans pretty quiet. I don't see anything unusual on the on the radar. Uh, stink bugs are up. Uh, something, you know, our number one pest consistently. Uh, that's not going to happen until we start seeing beans at R4 or R5. That's when those populations start to start to build up. So we got a ways to go there. Now you might, if you keep up with the ag trade magazine, see a lot of information about the red banded stink bug. I probably should have put a picture of that in here. Uh, we have something called the red shouldered stink bug, which sometimes occurred, but the red banded stink bug is a very much a southern insect. It, it doesn't typically make it up into Tennessee, but we've had a couple of years where we see the red banded make it up here, and it's typically after some warm winters, and we're going on the second warm winter in a row. So I'm a little bit concerned we're going to run into this red banded stink bug towards the end of the season in our later maturing soybean. Uh, you might want to look that one up, particularly if you got some wheat beans and things uh, that are going to mature later, you know, maybe some group five beans, because it's a little worse of a stink bug. It's, it does more damage. The threshold for it's essentially half of what we normally recommend for other stink bugs. I don't even think we have it in our control guide because I've probably only seen two fields in my career that needed to be sprayed in Tennessee, but I'm kind of expecting that to change. Uh, but typically, I think this is going to show up for us. If it shows up, it's going to be late September, that time frame. So I don't think it's anything uh, we're likely to <laughs> run into uh, very early on. And I'll be talking about this if the problem develops worse than I think. I think I'm going to stop sharing my screen, if I can figure it out, yeah, and uh, open it up for some questions and comments. I know that was a lot of talking. I haven't seen anything in the chat. I'll just make a comment. Um, I've seen several three corners up in my area here recently. Uh, in several Japanese beetles in the area? Well, three-cornered's are one that, you know, if you look at the distribution of the three-cornered alfalfa hopper in the United States, it pretty much stops at the northern border of Tennessee. And I'm sure it makes it up farther north than that. But it, the, my point is, it also does well in warm winters. And we've had two warm winters in a row. So I've seen quite a bit of three-cornered alfalfa hopper around. I'm, I'm a little bit concerned with some of these late beans, again, particularly if they have thin stands, that they might have some issues. And, and you really have to get out and look when those beans are small. You know, one of the biggest challenges to scouting all these crops when they're tiny and is 
is not recognizing the problem. It's actually getting to the fields because everybody's so tied up with planning and trying to get their herbicide applications made that they tend to forget about them crops. And then I get the phone call a month later when, you know, maybe too late. Hey, Scott, do you want to talk just a minute about the, the bee, uh, beekeeper deal? I mean, the bee reg, all that stuff, the, I guess the watch program or whatever. Can you mention Yeah, Yeah, I can do that. that. And, and of course, uh, you know, I'm a little more removed from it than I used to be because we have our new bee extension specialist, Dr. Saruta. Uh, but really that effort was kind of spearheaded and put together, I think, at the state level by Mike, Mike Studer. And he's really been pushing it pretty hard. So what he's what Kevin's talking about is there's a couple of online registries where beekeepers can go in and register the location of their their beehives. And if you Google field watch or drift watch, one word you'll find those. The other thing is growers can go in and they can also register their crops and comment on their their applications that they're making. And the whole point is to facilitate communication, to be thinking about hive placement, uh, so you're in lower risk areas, to make applicators aware that there's beehives in an area, uh, to let beekeepers know that there might be fields in the area that, that could be sprayed. Uh, it's strictly voluntary right now, so it's only as good, you know, data in is only as good, or data out is only as good as the data that's in. But it's it's been well adopted in some other states and increasing here. Uh, you've seen some growers uh, are using it not for bees, but they're doing it to to mark where the sensitive crops are. Uh, you know, for example, in tobacco growing areas, the tobacco grower might go in there and trying to let his neighbors know, you know, hey, I got tobacco in this area and I don't want you spraying dicamba around me, uh, things of that nature. So I think it's a start. You know, it's still kind of in the infancy. I mean, that, in Tennessee, uh, but uh, I'd, I'd encourage anybody if they have beekeepers to, you know, tell those beekeepers about it and, and get those hives registered. You essentially drop a GPS. And I'm not sure if quite all the information that you have to add in there because I've not done that for any of my hives. But, uh, uh, you know, I think it's, a, it's another resource tool, uh, you know, designed to help protect pollinators from pesticide drift, insecticide or herbicide. And, and again, there's... Uh, there's some utility for those that are growing ornamental crops. I, it seems to me when I look at it, probably the biggest buy-in has been in the, the central part of the state where we have a lot of ornamental crops and tobacco and, and maybe some vegetable crops that are pretty sensitive to herbicides. But uh, uh, we also have some pretty uh, active beekeeping associations in that Nashville area. And, and those guys are, a lot of them are all over it. There you go, Amanda's pulling it up right now. Several of my beekeepers, we have a very active beekeeper association and they've gone on here and registered. So it's it's being used around this area. Yeah, that's been my impression is it seems to be, you know, it's it's very much dependent on the, the association, I think, and uh, and also their place in the state. but. You know, I, I think it'll continue to build, and if people have good experiences with it, it'll continue to build anymore. It's it's kind of a way for growers to communicate with beekeepers, if not directly, at least indirectly, by knowing where everything's at. And that's to me, that's the biggest issue. I've talked with a lot of beekeepers and growers, and and most everybody's a, a good guy if you get them talking up front. What we don't want to happen, and I've had this conversation several times, is the first communication is there's a problem. Somebody's beehives got killed or somebody's, you know, tobacco got that camera dripped on it, whatever the case is. And, and it's because the first communication occurred after the problem. And really our goal should be to prevent those, those kind of incidents. Any other questions, or comments? I was just going to thank Scott for being on. Appreciate that update. And I appreciate that the news blog and, and everything that comes up. I get that, you know, whenever you update it, uh, that's a neat thing. Everybody, I'd encourage you to sign up for that. That stuff comes out and, and, and 
usually it comes out the end of the week. Normally we usually get the latest updates, but that's, that's a neat thing. Yeah. So, you know, we post an article on there and it comes out Thursday at five or six. I think it kind of depends on when the time change, you know, what, whether we're on daylight savings times or not, but the articles are immediately posted or tweeted. So it's got its own Twitter account. So you can follow us at UT crops and you can get the tweet immediately. Uh, you know, so I'd encourage y'all if you got a Twitter account just to follow UT crops. And there's a number of us that, you know, Dr. Steckel, Dr. Kelly, and myself that have our own Twitter accounts that, you know, we're retweeting things from other colleagues, things of interest. So uh, if you, if you're a Twitter bug, uh, I think there's some good resources there and, and, you know, you can get, real-time look at when an article gets posted and you don't have to wait till Thursday. So, uh, but again, sign up, you can sign up on the website. Uh, you know, if it's on your phone, that sign up may be at the bottom of the screen as opposed to the left menu, but uh, it's pretty simple, stupid. 